Welcome back to the series, An Introduction to 2D Materials. My name is Martin, and I'm a researcher in the field of 2D materials. In the last video, we looked at the Fermi surface nesting criterion, as well as some 2D materials that clearly violate the criterion, yet still show charge density waves. In this video, we will go over some of the experimental observations as a consequence of charge density wave order. In order to observe charge density waves, we need to think about the consequences of charge density waves. Recall that charge density wave is a phase transition, so there will be a clear signature in the specific heat and the thermal expansion coefficient. It is a real space modulation of charge, so real space tunneling experiments will work. And because of this lattice distortion, some phonons will be suppressed, which means that Scattering spectroscopy measurements will show clear signatures of this lattice distortion. The band gap appearing as a result of the shrinking of the Berlin zone should be visible in ARPES measurements. The band gap or the disorder to ordered state should also show up in R versus T measurements. And finally, the distortions in real space affects the reciprocal space as well, so diffraction experiments will also be sensitive to the charge density wave transition. Let's go over some of these in more detail. Charge density wave, like any other phase transitions, shows up as an anomaly in the specific heat. This is a consequence of the energy that need to be paid in order to order the system. The anomaly in the specific heat can be seen for superconductivity, magnetism, ferroelectricity, and of course in charge density wave transitions. A shameless plug here, but these are some of our works on measuring the anomaly in the specific heat and the thermal expansion coefficient due to the phase transitions in tantalum disulfide and tantalum diselenide. We measured the thermal expansion coefficient and the specific heat by monitoring their mechanical resonance across the phase transition temperature. Normally, measuring the thermal properties of microscopic 2D flakes is extremely difficult. Conventional methods like calorimetry is difficult to apply to exfoliated flakes of 2D materials, which are only a few nanometers thick and a few microns wide. In these works, we used optothermal driving and interferometry in a cryostat to measure the resonance frequency of suspended flakes of 2D materials and quantitatively extracted their thermal properties. I will perhaps explain these works in detail in a separate future video. Similarly, a mechanical probe called the vibrating reed measurement can be performed on bulk crystals to detect the changes in the Young's modulus at the phase transition temperature. By driving an AC signal to the nearby electrodes, the bulk crystals can be mechanically excited. When doing this as a function of temperature, these researchers observed a sudden softening of the Young's moduli of tantalum diselenide and niobium diselenide. Raman spectroscopy is a powerful tool to study the phonon modes in crystalline systems. Since charge density wave deals with lattice distortions, where some modes are destroyed and some are created as a result, Raman spectroscopy can be a great tool to detect the onset of the charge density wave state. On the left is a study on the charge density wave state of titanium selenide. As they cooled down the sample, the authors started observing the presence of EG and A1G phonons, which are associated with the charge density waves. These are not present at higher temperatures. On the right, the authors studied the charge density wave states in various crystals in their ultra-thin limits. It is clearly visible from these color maps that at certain temperatures, certain peaks emerge, and these are again associated to the charge density waves in these materials. The cone anomaly can be directly measured using X-ray or neutron scattering experiments at various temperatures. The neutron scattering experiments on the left shows the onset of the cone anomaly in blue molybdenum bronze, and a similar feature can be seen in the X-ray scattering experiments on niobium diselenide. In this work, we see the complete suppression of the phonons at QCDW. On the right is an X-ray diffraction experiment on 1T tantalum disulfide, which shows certain peaks associated to the charge density wave to appear. 
These peaks are traced over the cooling and warming cycles, which show hysteretic behavior. Next is the RT measurement. This is perhaps the most simplest measurement one can perform to detect the charge density wave transition. You get a crystal, stick three or four electrodes on, and perform resistance measurements as you cool down the sample. This can be difficult in systems like niobium diselenide, which has a rather small feature in the RT compared to tantalum diselenide or 1T tantalum disulfide, for example. But with carefully engineered cryostat and low noise electronics, one can measure the kink in the resistance. In tantalum disulfide and tantalum diselenide, these features are very clear due to the change from the linear to quadratic transition in the RT. On the right is again the 1T tensile disulfide, which shows a strong and sharp upturn in resistivity at the charge density wave transitions. They even show hysteresis in the temperature dependence. Once you have the four electrodes on the crystal, you might as well perform more experiments to confirm the charge density wave state. IV measurements can be performed to check for nonlinearity in the charge density wave state. Since in the normal state, the crystal should be metallic, the IV should show a typical ohmic behavior. But as you cool down to the charge density wave state, the IVs will look nonlinear. Similar to the washboard potential of Josephson junctions, charge density wave also has a washboard potential. By applying a bias voltage between the two ends, the washboard potential can be tilted. This shows up as a nonlinear IV where, until the threshold voltage VT, the conductance is very small and linear. And as you reach the threshold voltage, the washboard potential is tilted so much that the ball in this picture really rolls off to the side, resulting in much higher current. Another feature to look for in a system with more than one charge density wave state is a hysteresis in the IV due to competition. As you can see, especially in 1T tantalum disulfide, the hysteresis in the IV becomes larger as you go from room temperature down to the lower temperatures. The hysteresis results from the two possible ground states. One can sit in either of these states at intermediate temperatures, and by sweeping the bias to a high enough voltage to overcome the barrier in between, the state can be moved to the other ground state and thereby in a different branch of the IV. Bringing in the analogy to the Josephson washboard potential again, there is an AC transport phenomenon called Shapiro steps, which can be a signature of charge density wave. By applying a large enough AC excitation, one can excite the ground states out of the washboard potential. This results in step-like features in the IV exactly analogous to the Shapiro steps seen in Josephson junctions. These Shapiro steps in Josephson junctions are used in metrology because the voltage step sizes are proportional to the frequency of AC excitation. The AC excitation can be applied by combining AC plus DC in a frequency mixing configuration or by applying an AC signal to an antenna near the sample inside the cryostat to irradiate the sample with microwaves. An opposite effect can also be observed, where a DC signal excites an AC oscillations in the charge density wave material. In this study, the authors measured a sample of niobium triselenide using DC transport. They report a typical behavior in the DC transport. However, when they look at the Fourier transform of the noise, they saw resonance and harmonic excitations. It turns out that the frequency of oscillations can be tuned with the DC excitation applied to the sample. This effect can be seen below the second charge density wave state of niobium triselenide. Those were some of the few ways to experimentally observe the charge density wave state. Now I will briefly mention the different variations of charge density waves or density waves in general. First off, the charge density wave can itself be classified into several different categories. These are commensurate, 
nearly commensurate and incommensurate charge density waves. Commensurability of charge density wave is the relationship between the periodicity of the charge density wave to that of the underlying crystal. If the charge density wave has a wavelength that is integer multiple of the crystal underneath, then this state is said to be commensurate. If the charge density wavelength is not an integer multiple of the crystal underneath, and therefore the charge density wave order seems to be independent of the crystal in order, then this state is said to be incommensurate. Nearly commensurate is somewhere in between, as the name suggests. One t-tantalum disulfide has all these phases in one, for example, and the changes in the resistance across the different phases are quite sharp. Other forms of density waves include spin density waves and pair density waves. Similar to the charge density wave, these are a spatial modulation of either spin or the order parameter. In systems with spin density waves, the standing wave of electron cloud is spin polarized. Spin density waves are typically seen in magnetic systems, as can be expected. In systems with pair density waves, the order parameter has a spatial modulation. This is special to nodal superconductors, such as cuprates, which have D-wave pairing. Charge density wave, as I mentioned before, has a peculiar interaction with superconductivity. I will briefly mention some observations here. Charge density wave and superconductivity are said to be competing with each other. As I mentioned before, in niobium diselenide, by thinning the material down, you favor the charge density wave state and suppress the superconducting state. This can also be tested by creating disorder in the system. In this paper on the left, the authors irradiated the sample of niobium diselenide using high energy electrons with controlled doses and measured the charge density wave and superconducting transitions. Upon irradiation, there seems to be a steep decrease in the charge density wave state while the superconducting state increases slightly and above a certain irradiation value, charge density wave is completely destroyed and only superconductivity remains. However, the story isn't so simple. In this study, the authors measured the order parameters of both the charge density wave and superconductivity in several cuprates. Here they showed that the charge density wave and the superconducting gap seemed to coincide with each other across several dopings. So this goes to say that the coexistence and competition between superconductivity and charge density wave are yet to be fully understood. Next, an exciting avenue of research nowadays is the twistronics. 2D materials give researchers the full freedom to make heterostructures out of different or identical layers with twist degree of freedom, which is typically not allowed in 3D systems. In recent years, there have been reports of charge density waves and twisted structures of 2D materials, especially in twisted graphene systems. This work on twisted double bilayer graphene argues on the formation of density waves due to the nesting condition. The middle work on twisted mono bilayer graphene argues on the formation of charge density waves as a result of fractional charge filling in the moiré bands which leads to the breaking of the translational symmetry. On top of these experimental works, there are several theoretical predictions on density waves in twisted graphene systems. However, it should be noted that the density waves in these systems are unconventional in the sense that these are not associated to a lattice distortion, at least they are not reported thus far. Finally, we conclude this episode by summarizing the big questions about charge density waves. As mentioned earlier, the relation between charge density wave and superconductivity is still not clear. We don't have a universal theory of charge density wave in all dimension, and therefore we don't know the origin of charge density wave. And finally, the topological charge density waves in twistronic systems need irrefutable evidence of charge density wave ordering. In case you're curious about this topic, here are some good references. 
that deal with charge density waves. With that, let's conclude the second episode of An Introduction to 2D Materials. In this three-part episode, we had a broad overview of charge density waves in 2D materials. I hope you enjoyed these videos and I also hope that they may help you one day in your research. If you have any recommendations or requests on what I should cover in the future, please leave a comment down below. If I have the expertise to cover that topic, then I'll try my best to cover that topic. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next episode.